Hey, we've been a few weeks on a series talking about the generosity of God. And um, we, we looked at the forgiveness of God. We've looked at the grace of God. We've looked at so many different aspects of God's generosity. And, and today as we're moving forward, um, I've got a lot of Bible. I mean, a lot of Scripture. So there's going to be a lot of reading. And I don't know if they're going to put it all up or not. So I will give you the verses as we go. But one of the things that I want us to be mindful of is that the generosity of God is such an encompassing thing. It's hard to just kind of set it aside in a four-week ser- sermon series and cover all of it. I'm just kind of scratching the surface on the ways that God has been so generous to us. And as we're rolling into the Christmas season, obviously next week we'll be talking about the birth of Christ and God's generous gift of salvation by grace through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, and the coming of Christ. Today, I want to talk about provision, though. The provision of God, and that, that also is an all-encompassing thing. Now, Paul gives us a tremendous promise from God in his letter to the church at Philippi. And you may have this in your markdown as one of your favorite verses. In Philippians 4.19, he says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. There's a promise from God that for the children of God, that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches, not your abilities. And I love that, 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 that God has made us a promise. Jesus also reminds us um, that we can trust God for all things in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 25 through 33, and this is just kind of setting the concepts that it's not just an Old Testament thing. God has, from the beginning to the end, been a provider for His children. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his, to the, his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus reminds us again that for the children of God, that God has promised that He will meet our needs, the provision. I don't think about, how many of y'all woke up this morning and you had no food in the house? If you had no food in the house, there are means by which you can have. Because God provides richly. How many of y'all had to go in and pick out which shirt you were going to wear out of two? Or was it which shirt is clean out of 30? Uh, we live in a, in, in a world that we are, are overwhelmed with stuff. Our daily needs are so met that we don't even recognize that we actually have them. And so the reminder for us is that God's generous provision for His people should be and is intended to be a constant reminder, first, of His love. God loves us and He takes care of us because He loves us. He provides for us. Of His mercy, He doesn't have to do anything for us. He chooses to. And of His grace. From the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, I keep going back there because that's where we start with everything The story of Christmas does not begin in Bethlehem. The story of Christmas begins in the Garden of Eden. And so as we're working our way, I want us to think from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, God provided for man. And if you go back and read in Genesis, it's an amazing picture. He gave him all of the earth and all of its bounty for Adam to use and enjoy. Now, if we we think for just a moment, in the very beginning, he gave them all of the trees and all of the herbs and all of the plants and all of the stuff and said you can eat of all of it but this one thing. God provided. And He provided in a way that it wasn't just ordinary. We talked about that a little bit. It wasn't just basic. It was like, you don't like bananas? Okay, have an orange. You don't like apples? Okay, eat carrots. 
everything was out there. Now, if you move through, and after the fall of man, when animals became food, and man was now an enemy to animals, and you can track that all the way through, you will find an interesting concept. And in that concept, God says, now all of this will be food for you. God provided for the needs of man. But not only that, He also gave Adam Eve. He provided Adam with an equal. He said it's not good for him to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. He needs a personal, intimate relationship. And He created Eve to be that intimate person. A helper is what He calls him, or calls her. He provided His presence every day. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, it says that that God would come down in the cool of the day and He would walk and He would talk with man. And they had a relationship and God provided His presence. He provided His counsel. He provided direction. He gave Him all of this stuff. God's intention is that He be engaged in our life and provide for every need that man has. But then man chose to sin. And he ate of that one tree that God said don't. He said, well, that's kind of a a stiff penalty. Well, sin and rebellion comes with a stiff penalty. And if you remember the interesting story that he came down and he was calling out to Adam and Eve, and it it almost appears as if God didn't know where they were. He knew exactly where they were. And he's calling to them, and they are hiding from God. And he says, why are you hiding? Well, because we're naked. Well, how do you know that you're naked? They didn't know that before. He knew what they had done. They had sinned, right? They had eaten of the forbidden fruit. And not just eating fruit. They had rebelled against the Word of God. In that moment, follow me, in that moment, when their sin was revealed, God provided a covering for their sin. And the first sacrifice made for the sin of man was when God took the skins of animals and covered them in clothing. And the die was set. The blood is the payment for the sin. You see where that goes? But God provided for them a covering for their sin. We ought to really be thinking about that. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As we move through Scripture, we continually see a loving God that goes before His people and providing what they need. Now, if you have your Bibles open to Psalms 78, the Psalm 78, in the middle of this Psalm, and and I I picked it because it kind of gives us a snapshot of a very long story. It's dealing with, in a great part, the Exodus story. When the children of Israel were brought out of slavery in Egypt and into the Promised Land, And if you look at Psalm 78, it is a snapshot of what God did for His children in the midst of their rebellion. So I'll be reading verses 9 through 29. The Ephraimites, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to His law. They forgot His works and the wonders that He had shown them. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all the night with a fiery light. He split rocks in the wilderness, gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he, give, can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard he was full of wrath, a fire kindled against Jacob. His anger rose up against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust his saving power. That's a scary statement. But this is cool. Yet, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven and he rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in 
the heavens, and by his power he led out of the south wind. He rained meat on them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their dwelling, and they ate and they were filled, for he gave them what they craved. God saw the rebellion. Now, I, I want to go back and just let's kind of walk through a few things that took place. God first provided for them when He heard their cry, but He knew where they were. He knew that they were in Egypt. He knew that they were oppressed. And so He heard their cry and He came to their rescue. He provided for them a means. Moses. He provided a deliverer. Moses. When their backs were against the wall, and let's pause. Think about all the amazing things that God did to get them out of Egypt. All of the miracles, all of the stuff, all of the plagues, all of the things that He did to get them released where they could move. And they could go home, finally. When they rebelled, they forgot the blessing of God. When Moses delivered them, their back was against the wall between the Red Sea and the army of Pharaoh. I'm glad that Cecil B. DeMille made that movie. You know, the Ten Commandments. I, I don't know what it was like, but man, in the 30s when they made it, it was pretty cool. You've got the army of Pharaoh. He changes his mind. He's coming to get them. They're up against the Red Sea. The army's coming behind them. They're standing there. There's nowhere to go. It appears that doom is upon them, right? What do you do with a million plus people and all their stuff and an army of Pharaoh coming down? They got nowhere to go. And in the midst of that, when their back was against the wall, he opened up the sea and provided a path of dry ground for them to get across to the other side. When they got finally to the Jordan River, they rebelled once more and would not follow him into the promised land. Remember he sent out the 12 spies and it came back with a, a, an amazing report of all that the land was and all that it had. And God had told them, I'm going to give you houses you didn't build and vineyards that you didn't plant and crops that you didn't plant. I'm going to give you all of this. This will be a home for you. This is the promised land. And they said, yeah, but there's big people there and we're scared. We can't do it. And they rebelled. And I have in my mind this picture as they're standing there looking at what God intended and then they settled for what they wanted. And they turned and headed off into the wilderness. And for 40 years, they would wander around in the desert wilderness. Now you would think that God that had provided a means across the Red Sea, protection against the Israelite or the Egyptian army, you would think that the God had brought them to the river and was going to take them across. He would promised them He would give them all. You would think that when they said, no, we're not going to do it, that God would say, fine, do what you want to, I'll be here when you get back. That's what I would do. How about you? Have we ever done that with somebody? I said, fine. Go do what you want to. But what we see from God is the same thing that we saw when He provided for Adam and Eve. What we see from God with the children of Israel is that He goes with them into the wilderness. He follows them. Or if you would, He goes ahead of them into the wilderness. And in this recounting in Psalm 78, we see that He gave them light at night. How many of y'all have ever been out in the wilderness on a dark night? It's okay when the moon's shining. When the moon ain't shining, it's dark. When it's so dark that you can't even see, when you can't see your hand in front of your face, and you get, I don't know about you, but um, I used to do youth camp, and there's nothing more fun than having 12-year-old boys in the dark scaring the hound out of them. That's like the pinnacle of ministry when you get to do that. And I can just imagine having a million plus people and they're out there in this darkness. But God, realizing the fear that it would bring upon them, the, the terror that it would bring, and just the difficulty of trying to move around, God brought a column of fire and gave them light at night so that they could see. Let's just be honest. The older I get, the better I like this whole concept of leaving the lights on in the hallway. And if you're not where I am, you will be someday and you'll understand that. And so to get up in the middle of the night and they had light because God provided a fiery column of light to give light into the camp. Also, they're in the wilderness in the Middle East. It's a hot, dry place. And they're just wandering and they're moving from place to place. And it says that God provided a cloud 
to give them shade in the heat of the day. I'm going to tell you what, there's nothing that is better than when you're out working in the hot and you're just sweating in it and to step into the cool shade. And it's just a breath of fresh air, right? Now, if you come from anywhere southeast of here, you do not understand that because it's just as hot in the shade as it is with the humidity. It's awful. So you should move out west where shade has purpose. And that's to cool you down. But He provided them shade. He gave them food that they didn't work for. How do you feed this many people? Where do they grow the crops? What do they do? God listened to their gripes and He still opened the, the windows of heaven and brought forth manna. I don't know what manna is. Manna sounds amazing. It was something that God brought and it came like the dew. And you'll remember the story. All they had to do to eat was to get up in the morning, go out of their tent, pick up enough and put it in the basket for that day. God provided food. They're in the middle of the desert. There's no water. What does He do? He cracks open rocks. He brings forth streams. He provides water where there is none. And here's the really awesome deal. Their shoes and clothes never wore out. Wore the same sandals 40 years. Now I know some of you guys haven't changed your style in 40 years. You're still wearing the same. But you have had to replace a few things. He provided for them clothes that didn't wear out. He provided protection from the surrounding armies. It goes on and on. I could just keep talking about all of the things, but I hope we're beginning to understand the concept of God's provision. It's all-encompassing for the children of God. The instances are countless. And the reality is this, and I, I want you to write this down. The reality is God is overly and abundantly generous in His provision for His people. Overly and abundantly generous in His provision for His people. We can trust God to meet all of our needs. We can trust God to meet our needs. Now, learning to separate our needs from our wants is at times a very difficult process. True? Um, I need food. I want steak. I need shelter. I want a log cabin on a river with fish and snow and an endless supply of wood. I want everything. What do I need? The reason that so many get disgruntled with God is because their wants are not being met. We look at everybody else and we compare what we have compared to what they have and we think God loves them more. And if I could just get this, and if I could just get that. I don't know over the years how many times even I've been guilty of saying, if I could just make a little more money, then life would be better. If I could just have a little better car, then I could go places. If I could just have, if I could just have. And it's always looking forward to what I want, missing that I have what I need. Forgetting that I have what I need. I think we get the idea. God is faithful to meet our needs. The disconnect for us comes and the frustration comes when we don't identify what our real needs are versus our desires and our wants. The flesh will lead us into an emotional pitfall, won't it, of never being satisfied. Let's go back to the story. They said, we are hungry. We've eaten all of the, the supplies we brought. I'm ad-libbing. We've eaten all the supplies that we brought out of camp in Egypt. Now we're hungry. What are we going to do? And he brings forth manna. And manna, I don't know what it tastes like, but I bet it was really good. And it's like power pack. It's like a superfood. It's all you need. It's like sweet potatoes. You can live off of sweet potatoes. I didn't know if you knew that or not, but I wanted to share that. It's got all the, the nutrition that you need. Side note. <laughs> Squirrel. Squirrel. Yeah. They're good too. Um, so... He brings them this amazing, and what do they have to do? Do they have to kill it? Do they have to clean it? Do they have to cook it? Do they have to grow it? Do they have to... No, they go get it. They pick it up and they eat it. And what do they say? I want meat. So, wind blows in quail. How many of y'all like quail? 
I love quail. Quail's amazing. But it says that they ate so many quail that they were sick of eating quail. You see, when we get the idea that God is faithful to meet our needs, we can rest in peace and assurance. I'm going to have what I need because God has promised. Seek first the kingdom of God. Right? Focus on the Lord. I'll make sure that you have what you need. God will supply all of our what? Needs with His riches in glory. Second thing that I find fascinating in this is, is I have to be mindful that God's provision comes in His timing, not ours. We need to trust His timing. So often in my life, I've begged God for something that I thought I really needed. And I was certain without it, I would die. Obviously, I did not. I'm still here. I've looked at my life and, and, and sorted out a need. And I go before God, I really need this. I really need this. And He's like, not right now. I don't like not right now. How many of you are the most patient people on planet? It's what I thought, not a hand up. How many of you are the most impatient people on the planet? Yeah, that's us. We want what we want. We want it now. You can say, well, I'm more patient than you are. True. You're still impatient. God knows the deepest needs that we have. Emotionally, physically, spiritually. God sees past all of the superficial stuff that keeps distracting us. The squirrels that we chase and the twinkling lights that, that enamor us. God looks beyond that and He sees our needs and He acts accordingly. What do you mean he acts accordingly? Well, let me ask you a question. When did God give them light? When it was dark. God supplies your need when there's a need. When did he give them shade? When the heat of the sun was beating down on them. His timing. His purpose. So often, I want God to work on my schedule. The only time He gave them food was when they were hungry. He gave them water when they were thirsty. We have to learn to trust God's timing. How many of you all have prayed for something for a long, long time? And you haven't seen it yet. I am. I've prayed. and I am in the process right now of praying. Something I've been praying for for a long, long time. And I haven't seen it yet. And I can do one of two things. I can get angry with God because God is not hearing. And how many of you ever go back and say, hey God, let me rephrase this. But apparently you didn't understand what I'm asking. So, Dios habla español, okay. I've tried different languages. Let's see what happens. The problem is not that God doesn't hear us. The problem is not that God doesn't care. The problem is that God's timing is better than ours. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows that the things I think I'll die without would kill me if I get them. He knows that the things that I desperately desire will take me further away from Him, not closer to Him. He knows my needs and He will give us the things that He thinks we need in His time. In His time. That's a hard lesson, isn't it? They wanted it all and they wanted it now. They were kind of like on a J.G. Wentworth commercial. It's my money and I want it now. It's my food and I want it now. It's my land and I want it now. It's, hey, it's not ours. You see, all of the stuff that we think we need and that we're asking for and we're begging God for, it's not ours. It's His. Who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? Who has all of the riches in glory? Is it us? What possessions do we have? One body, one soul. That's what we got. That's all we got. Job said it best. Naked came I into the world. Naked shall I leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? He says, I don't own anything. Nothing that I'm desiring is going to be mine when I get it. It's God's. So let's wait on His time will benefit from God's timing. We'll benefit from God's timing. I'm reminded of another story talking about the food that I just want to hit. The Lord's Prayer. How many of y'all have memorized that and quoted it for years and years? 
there's something that we pass over. Give us this day our what? Why not give us this month all we need? God, give me an endless supply of daily bread. God, just like fill the store. Why do we pray? Why would Jesus instruct us to go before God and say, give me today what I need today? Dependence on the supply and provision of God. What do I need today? God knows. And He'll meet what I need today. Another interesting thing is that God always provides in ways we would never expect. Who would have thought in the middle of the desert that you could hit a rock with a stick and water come out? Who would have thought it? I've been in the desert. I've hit rocks. Nothing happens. God provides for us in ways that we never expect and things that we can't see through people, through the church, through all kinds of miraculous and interesting things. All of the resources of the universe are at His disposal because they belong to Him and He will distribute them in His time and in His interesting ways. Interesting ways. Manna fell out of the sky. Water came from the rock. And I don't know, I've lived in the Panhandle for 12, 13 years now. There's a lot of wind. I've yet to see my yard fill up with quail when the wind blew. I've seen it fill up with Walmart sacks, tumbleweeds, stuff, but never quail. We should always, this is another if you want to write down statement. We should always be amazed, but never surprised by how God's provision comes to us. Sometimes it's in ways that we never saw. It's the offer of a job. It's a, it's a holy handshake. That still happens in the world. You know what those are? It's when somebody just walks up, shakes your hands, and when they pull it back, they leave a gift in your hand. It's a means by which God says, I see you, and I know what you need, and I'm providing for you. Be patient. And be watchful. Because you never know how God will meet our needs. Anybody look back through your life and you're thinking of a time when there was a particular need and somehow it just happened and you don't know exactly how it all happened, but God just kind of showed up and this amazing provision was met. Yeah, it was, it's amazing. So guys, always be amazed and thankful. I'm going to add that. But never be surprised that God shows up and provides for us. I think the most telling thing in this story for me, though, and it's also the most painful for me personally, is in the midst of all of this, God provides for us even when we don't appreciate it. That's what makes God's provision so remarkably generous, is that He provides for us even when we don't appreciate it. We get so busy with life and desires and plans and things and doing stuff our way and making our own decisions and making our own judgments and, and going about life. And He's providing, He's providing, and we, and we don't even appreciate How many of y'all appreciated this morning that when you woke up, you could breathe? How many of you woke up this morning thankful that your body was able to get up out of the bed, even if it was slow and creaky and poppy, it still got up, okay? How many of us were thankful today that gravity exists? Sometimes gravity, you have to counteract but I'm glad it's here. Are we just, you know, I mean, are we thankful for the provision of God? Or do we just take it for granted and expect that He will just continue to do stuff? In this interesting story, we see that God provides even when we don't appreciate it. The most striking thing to me about the wilderness journey is that throughout the whole story, the children of Israel never stopped grumbling and complaining. Period. They never stopped. They were constantly complaining, not about what they had, but about what they didn't have. They were not able to recognize God's amazing protection and God's amazing provision and God's presence around them because they were just looking at everything that they wished they had they didn't have. They never stopped, never stopped griping. Nothing was ever good enough for them. And I'm not picking on them because the truth of the matter is, Generally, we never stop griping and we never stop complaining and nothing is ever good enough. What 
before I could make a statement, and I may just do it. That's why people are in credit card debt up to their eyeballs. They'll never pay off till they die because they cannot be content with that which God has provided. So if that's you, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Nothing was ever good enough for them. Nothing ever seemed to satisfy. You ever had one of those days when you're hungry, but you don't know what for? And you eat one of everything you can find, and that's not it? That kind of just explains our life, doesn't it? We wake up and we know we have these, but we're not exactly sure what they are, and God starts supplying them and we'll go, no, that's not it. No, no, that's not it. And at the end of the day, whatever God did for them, they always wanted something else. And let's just be honest. Let's look in the mirror. What God has done for us, do we go, thank you, God. This is amazing. Or do we go, I don't want that. I want something else. I'm not happy with this. I want something else. I want something else. I want something else. It drives me insane because it's always in my head. Paul said, you know what? In his life, and he, he was a, a power preacher. He was an, an amazing evangelist. He was the one that took the gospel to the Gentile world. And Paul saw it all. Paul was in shipwrecks. Paul was in prison. Paul was beaten. Paul was stoned and left for dead. Paul had all of these amazing stories. He knew what it was to be on the top of the game where people were pouring out gifts to him and he knew what it was like to be left alone with nothing. And he said, I have figured something out in life. And I think this is true for all of us once we get there. I figured out something in life. I can be content wherever I am with whatever I have if I have Jesus Christ. Because He supplies my needs according to His Riches in glory. You know why people struggle with drugs and alcohol and pornography and all of the, the addictive behaviors there are because they can't be satisfied with that which God has provided. They're trying to fill a God-shaped hole that He's already plugged with something else. And it never satisfies. He's giving them the food of angels falling from the sky and they want onions from Egypt. God pours out our daily bread and we want something else. I want to look at them and I want to pass judgment on them for being so self-centered, so ungrateful that God had done all of this He'd given them amazing opportunity. He'd given them life. He'd given them promises. He's provided for, I want to just look at them and go, you are so wrong. The problem is, I have to look at me. And I am so wrong. I wonder how often I disregard the generous provision of God in my life. Because I'm never satisfied with that which I have. How often do I complain because my wants are not being met? And I fail to recognize that my needs are always being met. Do I grumble against a generous God because somebody else has got it better than me? Somebody else's life is easier than mine. Somebody else's job is better. Somebody else's spouse or kids or family. Or... Do I grumble against a generous God that has given me all that I need according to His riches and His grace and His mercy and His love? He doesn't have to do anything. But do I grumble? Do we grumble? Do we gripe? Do we not even recognize the generous hand of God every day on our life. I spent a few days at Palace this week and there's a witness that can back me up on that story because she also spends time there. And one of the interesting things about this week is that the big push of finals. Ugh. 
College kids everywhere, 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 pushing, 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 trying to get it, trying to get it, trying to get it, trying to get through all of this. And they're going so fast in life that they forget to thank God. And I'm not picking on them. I'm the same way. That one, you have the ability to read. You have the ability to interact and to learn. You have the ability to process information. You have the, the amazing ability to go to a school. To have the, the opportunity to go to a school. Where did that come from? From God. What's God's provision? All of the things in life that we take for granted is just, we've worked hard, we're doing this, it's about us. No, it's not. It's about an amazing God that provides opportunities and abilities and says, do what you want with them. May we never grumble against a generous God. So as we move forward to the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and that's coming quickly. Next Sunday, as I said, we're going to be talking about the generous gift of Jesus Christ. Oh, man. I don't know if an hour will be sufficient. We'll see. As we move forward to the celebration of Christ, I pray that you and I this week will take a step back and breathe and be grateful to a generous God for His generous provision today. He loves us. Jesus told an interesting story. He said, which one of you, being a man, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a stone? Remember that? Which one of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish to eat, would give him a rock? He said, if you, being evil, know how to do good, how much more will our Heavenly Father do for us? What is the end of His Provision, there are none. Because all that there is and all that there ever will be belong to Him. And our God will supply all of our needs according to His riches in glory. Do you know Him as your Lord, as your Savior? Are you depending upon the God of glory or on the flesh. Guys, we can fight life and try to make the most of it we want to, and at the end of the day, we lose. Because we got no resources to work with. We have nothing to work with that God has not generously placed in our hand. And the greatest resource we have is a relationship with a personal God through His Son. If you don't have that, Today is the greatest day of blessing for you because God is ready to receive whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your generosity. And I thank you so much that your generosity is not based on our gratefulness. And I'm... I'm extremely thankful that your generous provision is not based on my timing and what I feel, but on your wisdom and knowledge and sovereignty. God, may I learn every day to depend on you, not me. God, I know that you desire the greatest gifts for us. And the greatest gifts that you desire are not physical or material. The greatest gift that you would desire us to have is peace in our heart. And calmness in our spirit. Because I know that we have a Redeemer. And He is a personal God that loves me. God, so often we go through life... In fighting mode, trying to, to gather everything we can and make the most of it. And it's all so temporary and unfulfilling because the more we get, the more we want, the more we want, the harder we work and the further away we go 
from depending on your provision. God, you are a wonderful, loving, kind, merciful, and gracious God that generously provides for those that love him. So Lord, today I ask you to move in our hearts, in our individual hearts. And may the Holy Spirit speak to us about the reality of what we do with your generosity. Do we grumble against it? Do we complain about it? Do we discard it, disregard it? Do we walk away in contempt of your generosity? Or do we receive it with glad hearts, with grateful hearts? Are we like the nine lepers that were healed and walked away without saying a word? Or are we the one that comes back to say, Thank you, God, that you love us? Lord, as we roll into this coming week of festive and fun and family and travel and stuff, I pray that in the midst of that, we don't lose sight of the truth of your generosity and your provision and your love for us. Because without you, we have nothing. So Lord, if there's one here today that maybe for the first time are willing to set aside the flesh and, and call upon your name and trust in your provision for eternal life, your provision for the daily bread, your provision, I pray that right now they would say, here I am, God. I don't know what this all means, but I want what you want in my life. If that's you, come see me. Let's pray together. Let's praise together. Let's search the Word of God together and reveal the abundant riches of His glory that He bestows upon those who are His children. We love you, Lord. We thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen.